Hello everyone, my name is Meg from Brighton Students Union and I'm here today with Dr Caroline West and she's going to be speaking to us today all about the topic of consent and the importance of consent and I've got a lot of questions to ask her. How are you Caroline? I am all. all good apart from being absolutely frozen because I'm not used to yeah. snow anymore. <laughs> <laughs> from that, I'm cozy I have blankets I'm all good do you want to introduce yourself Caroline for the people who don't know much about you like your background sure. history your passions that kind of thing at the moment I have many jobs um I'm a lecturer in social care but I've also lectured in sexuality studies I write a weekly sex column for evoke.ie I have a podcast wow. on sex called Glow West. Um, I'm on a TV show called Elaine on Virgin Media One once a month to talk about sex. There's, wow. there's a lot of talking about sex in my life <laughs> at the moment. Um, and then I finished my PhD last year now, and that was in sexuality studies, looking at women's experiences working in porn. So before that, I also had a master's degree in sexuality studies and during and before all this as well I've worked for about worked and volunteered in social care for about 20 odd years so wow. um, at the moment I work in a women's refuge as well so that's been about seven years of that aspect as well so um yeah long CV for some things but <laughs> definitely a lot more sex these these days so as we're talking about consent today and the importance of consent do you mind just telling us where your passions of consent come from? Because I know you're very passionate about that topic and how important it is. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I've been trained to give consent workshops for about three years now. I, I'm basically really passionate about it because I didn't get any of that education growing up and I didn't get any decent sex education growing up. And I had some like meh sexual encounters. I had some awful sexual encounters. I had some good ones. And I kind of like... I'd like people to be able to have the tools to empower themselves to have brilliant sex lives and to avoid some of the mistakes maybe that I made or, you know, some of the situations that I found myself in because I had no idea about consent outside the, the binary, I suppose, of yes means yes and no means no. I didn't mm. know, you know, how to ask for consent or what it actually really looked like in, in practice. We are a healthier society when we are having good sex and when we're happy about our sex lives and our bodies and our boundaries and our consent and all those kind of things. So, you know, there's no need for stigma and silence and shame around sex anymore so I think yeah. it's now is the time you know like lots of people in college are gonna have lots of sex probably most likely so why not empower them to have it on their terms and to have it be mm. good sex and empowering sex definitely I was actually gonna ask you this later on but I feel like it relates now I was just really interested to know where do you think this stigma comes from around talking about sex like there's so much stigma around it yeah, I think for some it's cultural reasons, for some it's religious reasons. Like growing mm. up in Catholic Ireland, it was definitely religious reasons. Sex is something that's kind of complicated for a lot of people because there's no one way to do it. There's so many different ways to have sex and there's so mm -hmm. many different ways to even define what sex is and what sexual pleasure means. And we're all kind of worried, like, am I normal? And am, am I doing it right? How much is too much? How, uh, you know, what's the correct amount of of time to have sex all these kind of things and we yeah. haven't really had a safe space to kind of ask people about that we have the media which is very much like you should be having all this wild wonderful sex and swinging from the rooftops and sex in the city and sex isn't like that for a lot of people so you know it, it, it looks really different for everyone else and I think when we have that lack of sex education combined with it I think people yeah can be really disempowered by that and not really know okay like what's going on is this normal is this sexual abuse is this sexual pleasure yeah. like is this just you know what is sex all about even like things like our names you know like you know what we call our 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 private parts see even that name is like okay we can't name it it's just like an elbow it's a vulva even saying the word vulva some people are like isn't it a vagina it's like no vagina is the inner part your vulva is your outside part um, but even naming things like that, you know, it, it's something that it doesn't need to be there. And it, like sexual embarrassment and it can be it's learned, but it can be unlearned, which is the good thing. So I'm hoping that people coming along to the workshops will come come away with a little bit more sense of empowerment and a little bit more comfort around their own sex lives and, and then go on. So it's a little stepping stone towards dismantling any kind of shame or stigma around sex because life is too short and sex is pretty awesome for most of the time. So why not have good sex? 
Yeah, exactly. And like you were saying, education is so important. Like they should be teaching about like consent and like relationships and how to be a good friend, that kind of thing in schools from an early age. It's so important um, because that just doesn't happen, does it? For the people watching who um, may want to come to these workshops, what kind of things would you be doing in the workshops? first of all it would be amazing if people were to come it's it's not a lecture as such you know I'm not there to yeah. say this is how you have sex this is what consent <laughs> is and, you know it's fun it's informal it's very calm you know it, it's a kind of an informative calm chat really so um very informal so we're going to talk a little bit about what consent actually looks like how to get around the awkwardness because we all know we can feel a little bit awkward around asking or giving sexual consent so some practical tips of what that looks like in reality I suppose um, and then we often hear stories about the gray area of consent so if you you know if you've consumed any alcohol or if you've consumed drugs or sex um, if you're working as a sex worker things like this are like the gray areas so, so we're going to kind of pick that apart a little bit as well we might do some interactive talks if we have time if there is um, you know demand for that as well and there's no pressure for anyone to say anything publicly whatsoever you can use the chat function um the anonymous Q&A function as well to share anything that you want and we're going to have a little look about things such as like how you identify what's healthy sex so I think consent is like a spectrum sometimes and you know yeah. it's it's a lot deeper than yes means yes and no means no like that's mm-hmm. very simple and of course yeah. that's true but we can pull that apart a little bit more and dive into it so we we'll look at things such as like what is sexual co- coercion and have a look at like what is a healthy relationship and how does consent to fit into a healthy relationship as well so it's for all genders because anyone can be a victim and anyone can be a perpetrator and there's no judgment of you know what kind of relationships are there like these are Mm. you know it's a talk for consent whether you're having a five minute quickie or a long-term <laughs> married relationship or whatever it happens to be because you can apply those lessons to about consent and boundaries and pleasure to whatever form of sex you have and that's part of the fun of sex it takes so many weird and wonderful forms so you know again it's there's no stigma there's no judgment so moving on to like a really interesting topic um around covid and consent in COVID times. I was wondering, how do you think dating um, and consent has changed in lockdown? So I know people use um, platforms such as Tinder, Grindr, um, that kind of thing. How do you think that's changed since this pandemic started? We might date online a little bit longer than we would have. I know like when I was using Tinder and stuff, I always had a rule that I wouldn't wait longer than a week before meeting someone because then it's like, oh, Mm. I've got all this energy to give and then we'll meet up and I I instantly don't like them and I've wasted like weeks and weeks. So I'm like, you know, your seven, seven day rule was my thing. But of course, at the moment that's kind of different if we're trying to meet up and stuff but Mm -hmm. there's some really interesting ways to look at consent and boundaries and dating so you know you're having conversations are you going to meet up or are you not going to meet up are you going to go on a virtual date you know to like a museum that has an open gallery exhibition or you know the Dua Lipa concert whatever happens to be um Mm -hmm. are if you are going to meet up like are you going to practice social distancing are you going to wear masks is there going to be any chance of the kiss all those are conversations about consent and boundaries as well. So yeah. if they can't respect that, that's an interesting way to look at a red flag because they mightn't respect consent in other areas as well. So you're outlining, if you're saying I'm okay with meeting up, but you have to wear a mask and we have to meet outdoors. And if they're like, ah, oh, no, I don't want to do that. You've clearly set out, this is my mm. comfort level. And that person has gone, I'm not interested in respecting your comfort level. So you've just yeah. saved yourself a red flag of trouble, you know, down yeah. the line. It's an interesting time though, because so we make judgments about each other in one tenth of a second online, which is yeah. so quick. It's like quicker than snapping your fingers almost. And like you can't tell what a person is really like by sometimes awful Tinder profile pictures, let's face it, and our grinder <laughs> pictures. Like a, a picture someone's asked, you're like, Okay, if that's what you're looking for, that's fine. But that doesn't tell you about them as a person, you yeah. know, as a whole. Um, so, you know, it, it, 
we're kind of looking at are we judging people too quickly like maybe we're reevaluating mm. what we're looking for in relationships and maybe not judging someone because of a picture of their shoes or their badly lit selfie or you know mm. whatever happens to be but then we also have accelerated intimacy so that means like we can really get to know each other if we're sitting on zoom for three hours on a date when we might normally do that on, on you know regular dating and uh, in person I think thinking about tinder and stuff then what tips do you think you'd give obviously we can't do this now because of covid times but in non-covid times what tips would you give to people um in terms of safety because i know a lot of a lot a tip i heard was always meet the person in a public space yes that would be number one i'm guessing yeah because you just don't know they could be the nicest person online but if you're arranging to meet their house even if they're just really annoying and they know where you live and could just turn up and, and just go, oh, it's just yeah, passing by. And I thought that's and, so true. Yeah. And that's the best case scenario of, of they're just a melt and you don't want anything to do with them. If there's someone that's dangerous or, you know, someone who's a stalker, they know where you live now. And, and yeah. you've just, you know, it creates a lot of issues. So and people yeah. can pretend to be others online. And we have seen cases, um, especially for LGBT people as well, of homophobic uh, not very nice people I'm not sure if I can swear um who would pretend to be someone else and then lure that person or you know turn up at their house and then assault them so we have cases like that to kind of consider so yeah meet in public place where there's witnesses um you know don't give out too many details about your life like don't tell people where you work or anything like that um, yeah the issue of sending nudes you know I'm not here to judge anyone for sending nudes but I would say things like put a watermark on your nudes so you know if they get shared anywhere you know exactly who's who has leaked that and then you can right. go to the appropriate authorities around that as well so right. we've finally just passed legislation for this in Ireland you guys over in England are a little bit ahead of us you've had laws for a little bit longer but even things such as a little watermark on it saying I sent this to so and so you know things like that so you can kind of protect yourself a little bit that way and just remembering that if anything like that does happen it's not your fault it's the solely 100,000 million percent the person who chooses to violate that consent and send it on so it's not you know I know we use the term revenge porn but it's not it's yeah. image-based sexual abuse and it's yeah. you know ways to cause trauma to people um yeah so just kind of being a bit cautious maybe and remembering that people online or even people in real life may not be who they say they are and we need to take a little bit of time to get to really know people and watch now for green flags and red flags as well so it's kind of like an interview process to kind of see yeah. what someone's actually really like as you were saying about like revenge porn and unsolicited images and sexual messages and that kind of thing getting out and not trusting people a lot of people when they hear the word consent or sexual assault they think of in a club or I don't know, in a relationship or wherever in a setting, but I know that a lot of sexual assault and misconduct happens online too. So do you think that's probably heightened since the pandemic? I think so. I think, so. I think it's quite high anyway. You know, I think yeah. it's a lot more prevalent than we'd obviously like it to be. Right. And, it, you know, it comes under the term cyber flashing. So the unsolicited dick pic is cyber flashing. There's some right. interesting research done in this so and, and gender really comes into it so these are very stereotypical statements but it's some of the men who send those unsolicited dick pics they are sending them because they think the women would like it because they're there for sex they want to see what they're working with and that's it the response from women who receive them is almost like 99 percent negative they just do not mm. want to, don't appreciate it, view it as harassment, view it in completely yeah. negative terms. In some other communities, like um, for gay men, a lot of them said that they were okay with it and they welcomed it and they found it to be an erotic thing. So again, it, it kind of depends on what's going mm. on, but it all comes down to consent. Pictures of gentles can be really hot, but the key to all of that is consent to the person yeah. ask you for it so yeah it, I mean it's just it's the modern day equivalent of standing in the street and flashing in a raincoat and no great love story was ever started with oh yeah he sent me a picture of his penis on Facebook and I decided to marry him it's hard to think about because obviously I've always seen it happen but you don't think of it as what was the term you used cyber flashing 
yeah you don't get taught about that and how it's actually really wrong a lot of people just find it like kind of a joke and they laugh about it with their friends but actually it could be really harmful this is part of if we look at the idea of rape culture and we'll talk about consent culture in the workshops as well but rape culture is if you imagine a triangle so at the very very top is in-person actual sexual assault involving mm. bodies touching each other but then the bottom you have things such as you know revenge porn or you have like unsolicited images coming in or jokes about things or mm. you know oh it's just a joke I suppose the mission that I would be on and then with the classes we'll talk about is consent culture and how we can really change things and how we can dismantle concepts such as victim blaming because they they are there. So the same way that sexual assault is a spectrum, consent is a spectrum as well. And we need to look at these in society as well. And I think part of the problem for not understanding all this is we're not taught about it. There's so many different forms and it affects different genders and affects like so many different ways. And, you know, cyber flashing is a part of sexual assault. Revenge porn is a part of sexual assault. It's just that spectrum of what it consists of. And I think the more conversations we have about that, the more people might look back and go, Oh yeah, okay, that actually happened to me and now I have a term for it. Like things like negging, you know, mm-hmm. like negging is part of sexual assault because you're manipulating someone into having sex with you. And like that's that there's no full willing ongoing mutual consent in that when when you're tricking someone and and belittling them and, and emotionally abusing them to have sex with you. That's that's not healthy sex, you know. So Yeah. All those things really need to be talked about. So we'll try to get into as much as we can in the workshops. I know they're only like an hour long, but at least there'll be a stepping stone into like bigger conversations down the line and maybe bigger conversations with friends as well. You know, it's nice to kind of think, you know, in different friend circles, different communities, different genders. Again, we're all going to have different opinions on this. So it's nice to be able to go, hey, what are your thoughts on that? And kind of yeah that conversation forward a bit more it's good to have a discussion about these things without judgment and just be open about it. I feel like that's the main thing to think about when you have conversations like this just you know non-judgmental we're you know. all learning you know and yeah. you know like I'll show my age but I'm 38 I, I like I still was learning and you know my 30s were just a mess of, of learning all these things and stuff and it, it's like yeah. because we we don't have those safe spaces a lot of the time to ask a lot of these questions like the me too movement was great but it, it brought up a lot of people who were looking at some of the examples and going that's not sexual assault and people who were like that is definitely sexual assault but because yeah. we hadn't named it as that we only see sexual assault as like that top 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 pyramid stuff you know we, we haven't seen it all trickle down so there's a lot there's a long way to go of learning but it's okay if we're on step one or it's okay if we're on step 100. Another thing that I wanted to chat with you about was around the fear and embarrassment of asking for consent whether that's in a relationship like a romantic relationship or any other kind of um, encounter of asking for consent and people they find it awkward or they find it you know it ruins the moment that kind of thing but how do you how would you suggest that people ask for consent you know that yeah. comfortable way there's loads of different ways I think we think of asking for consent is may I please touch your shoulder okay now may I please touch your breast now may I please touch it and okay that's very formulaic and like that's not half for most people like that's fine but if you're saying like oh my god I want you to do xyz to me like do it now I can't wait that's consent like and also yeah. that's really hot as well or there's lots of like enthusiastic consent and then there's sometimes in a long-term relationship sometimes you're going oh, I don't know if I can be really bothered but I know halfway through it'll get kind of hot and I'll be really into it so go on yeah. then like that's not what you're, is going to happen on you know a one-night stand or whatever and that's not appropriate for that but in a long-term relationship when you've discussed consent long time that works mm-hmm. as well and then you're going after it's going oh yeah okay like it was kind of hot but I just wasn't in the mood because desire isn't like like you know instant for some yeah. people it takes a little bit of time so to interesting work up, but again yeah and that's you know but that's again that's a long-term relationship when you've established a relationship and you've established boundaries and consent and stuff but yeah. you know even things such as oh god I can't I can't wait to touch you here or like you know like those pants are great but they look better on the floor like can I take them off that's asking (laughs) for consent 
a tone of voice is also really important so if mm-hmm. you even said may I, may I kiss you or whatever and so if you just said it like that that's gonna be different but if you like whispered it into someone's ear and yeah. you like maybe had your hand on on like a non-sexual part of their body and kind of you know moved it that's also ask for consent and that's really hot as well so we have mm-hmm. a few examples to go through in the workshop as well yeah. but again it's like there's so many different ways and they're not formal so maybe sometimes when we think of asking for consent and it runs the moment, yeah. it can actually really enhance the moment so yeah even things like asking for a kiss you know some people might say you know oh may I please kiss you okay that might be hot but some of them are like oh my god you're gorgeous I can't wait to kiss you can I, can yeah. I please kiss you something like that whatever happens to be is going to be really hot for someone um yeah. so yeah lots of different ways it's all like the intent behind it as well so mm-hmm. um like if, if it helps people get started you know they can have like a stock book of phrases they can use and, and go okay I'm going to try this one and then yeah. see what develops with that relationship with that person like you might come up with your own code code words for sex yeah it can be absolutely hot and I, I think sometimes we think of you know you'll see headlines sometimes of someone's developed an app where both of you have to like put your fingers on the screen at the same time and that means like you're both signifying consent or something it's like that's completely not what consent is like you know you can't just like both go okay we're consenting at the start like consent changes and halfway through yeah. you might decide I'm not into this anymore a lot of people think well I've said yes at the beginning so I have to carry on they can't they, they feel like they can't say no halfway through or if you got anything like any tips or advice to say to those people yeah, it was sometimes it, it can just be like, oh, I'm not feeling this anymore. Or sometimes it might be a case of you don't want to do anything anymore with that person. Or sometimes mm-hmm. it might be like, I actually don't want to go as far as having an orgasm. I'm not really in the mood or oh, I gave I didn't want to do this last week, but I don't want to do it this week. So, again, mm-hmm. consent is on, ongoing like that. So you can revoke it at any time. You yeah. just change your mind for whatever reason. And it's all yeah. legitimate. That's your not in the mood whatever it doesn't matter um but if it's a case where you're wondering okay this person is going to listen to me and this may be a sexual assault situation you know there's a few different responses there's fight or flight which we hear about most of the time um but then there's also fawn and freeze understanding all those things make it easier to kind of look back and go oh that that was my response when this thing happened and to realize that's okay that was your body protecting you at that time and Mm -hmm. you know because some people might say oh well you didn't fight them off then therefore you were enjoying it or they looked like they're enjoying it and all these myths like not to get too personal but I had my own situation like that and my response was to fawn because I was like okay I'm going to pretend I'm into this because I can't get out of this room safely and if I say no I don't think that's going to be a safe thing either so I'm just going to pretend I'm some super sex god because that's what's going to save me right now and that worked but then afterwards you have to process that and go oh okay like what why did I do that and it's like it's just your body going this is the safest option at the moment and stuff Mm -hmm. so I suppose bringing in compassion and empathy and education into those responses after but if it wasn't a sexual assault situation as in like there was no ill will you just change your mind and you're just you know with a person that was going to respect that I think even just saying I'm not interested anymore like can we just stop with my things like that so there's there's lots we'll have we'll talk about that in the workshop as well like different kind of approaches to that as well but you know just because you consented to one activity doesn't mean you consent to others another myth I feel like is around a lot is the idea that just because you're in a relationship it means that there doesn't need to be consent why do you think that's the case and how can we change that about society yeah couples get very comfortable sometimes in relationships and and Mm -hmm. don't talk about things but everything changes all the time and something that you maybe liked when you were 17 is not what you like when you're 27 or 20 when you liked you know yesterday isn't the same as what you want to do today and your desire changes over time your kinks change your libido changes it's kind of good to have a healthy relationship check in from time to time and just say hey remember that thing like do you want to do that again or you know um yeah do we want to try this so maybe having a list of what your definite yeses are like your hell yeses um that Mm -hmm. are like oh my god this is awesome we love doing this to your maybes to your "Ah, I'll do it but I'm not really interested in it and it's like that's not an enthusiastic yes so some people would say that's a definite no but for some people they're like oh I don't mind it but 
it's not like the most amazing thing in the world and those are all going to change over time as well and they're affected by different things like stress and you know medication like SSRIs like you know our antidepressant medication that can impact libido as well so um you might have had sex you know once a day or whatever and then you start medication or you're stressed or we're living in a pandemic we're all stressed I mean you're thinking oh we're in lockdown together it's great we'll have loads of sex and then you're just sitting around your pajamas drinking wine all day because you're just <laughs> stressed and anxious and you're not in the mood for sex or how you feel about yourself changes yeah. and all these things so yeah. it's really nice to kind of remember that I suppose that check-in isn't just around sex it's around the relationship as well like even just saying oh my god look I'm so embarrassed but like we need to talk about this you should feel safe and comfortable and that you can trust your partner to have that kind of conversation um, so the next question I wanted to ask was around, as a culture, I feel like we have this need to not say no because we want to say no because we're not in the mood. We have, a lot of the time, um, people feel like they have to make up excuses, stereotypically women a lot of the time. I feel like they need to think of an excuse um, as to why they don't want to have sex, whether that's I've got a headache or I'm tired or I've got this to do. When, really we should just be able to say no I'm not in the mood or I'm not feeling it why do you think that is why do you think we do that as culture yeah I think I think so women and femmes are really socialized into being nice you know we're, we're told not to speak up or to be you know look good and, and shut up for sometimes and um you know none of that means that our words are taken seriously sometimes and we also have the culture of like if you even think back to like cowboy and indians and all those films and stuff um like in the wild west kind of stuff you know it was always like the girl was like grabbed and she'd say no and she'd fight off the kiss but then he'd start kissing mm. her anyway and then she'd go oh okay actually this is really nice and you're like no <laughs> that's that's, yeah. that's not okay um so it, it teaches people that no doesn't actually mean no no either means more wine or no means convince me or all these things and we see this in yeah. porn as well of people might say no and you know then it's like the action will still kind of happen and there's also like a lack of I suppose sex education as well of, of like yeah. what we're thinking sex actually is and you know mm -hmm. for the longest time my idea of sex was sex is penetration and yeah there's so much more to sex than that like you know oral sex it's not foreplay it's just sex as well so we might think like I'm actually not in the mood for sex but what you're thinking of is oh, I'm not really in the mood for penetrative penetrative sex that ends yeah. in an orgasm like sometimes you're like oh, I'm not really in the mood for that but I actually wouldn't mind cuddling or I wouldn't mind whatever happens to be I'm just not in the mood for like the, the full bells and whistles kind of thing so it's about like figuring out like what sex means for us because it's different yeah. for everybody you know they might feel oh I have to sit, make up an excuse and say I have a headache or whatever rather than saying no you're actually being an asshole and you're pressurizing me and that's hard to say and so we but we still have cultures that are like that and, and societal pressures that are like that and even mm -hmm. like even like you know a girl who um experience it or wants to experience sex is called things like a slut whereas a guy is usually like a stud or you know it celebrates like having a high notch on the bedpost kind of thing so we still have those kind of double standards that are yeah. there in society yeah I went to a catholic school um, and it was very much it was just we didn't have sex education or PSHG or anything we just had science lessons and it was just um this is how you make a baby and that was it <laughs> Matt yeah, yeah and like most people nowadays aren't having sex to make a baby you know unless it's yeah. a very specific set exactly. Of <laughs> exactly another topic I, which is kind of different I wanted to ask about was what a friend could do um in a situation where they don't feel like consent is happening. They don't, they feel like what they're seeing isn't quite right. What it's really difficult, but a question I always see is what can they do as a friend or even a bystander in that yeah. setting? So sometimes um, I know there's one university down in Cork that has a bystander program and, uh, you know, it would be great if yourselves brought that in. We made this mandatory wow. across all courses because there are people that said they, they've done this. They've learned what to do as a bystander and they feel really empowered to help people wow. afterwards. So it's, it's yeah. really great. Um, but I suppose things such as if you remember um, 
the, even the example of um, the people on the tube and you're watching someone being racially abused, even going up to them and go, hi, Mary, you know, I haven't seen you in ages and, and sit down and chat next to them away as yeah. if like you haven't you know as if you're best friends or whatever so sometimes doing that if you're seeing someone say who maybe is, is maybe looks really drunk and there's some that you're kind of picking up bad vibes around just sitting there yeah. and go oh come on we'll go get you a kebab and you know like talk to them as if like you know your yeah. best friends and so that person knows okay there's the witness here there's only so much you can also do as a bystander as well like if someone is determined to go in a situation it can be quite hard to, to stop that and that, that's it can be really hard around situations such as domestic violence and sometimes you can make it worse um if yeah. you do intervene because the the victim might think I'm going to get it now when I get home because you know there's attention being drawn to this as well so um if you're feeling like it's not a safe um situation for you personally to intervene then you can always call um the guardy for help or the police um or you know if you know there's a group of friends nearby maybe sometimes there's strength in numbers if if you know if you were all going to go um and talk to that person as well because maybe they don't feel like okay i don't have to get myself out of this situation which is only normal and you know that's what happens to a lot of us but again to remember that you know you ha- you do have limited power so maybe calling attention to like if there is a bouncer around or something like that if you're in that kind of situation so um just I suppose treating with people with empathy and trying to say if I was in that situation what would I like to have done and would I yeah. like someone to come t- talk to me or mm-hmm. you know not judging them not saying I told you so not saying come on yeah. what are you doing with them why don't you yeah. leave them it's a lot more complicated than that in real life how, how do you think you'd advise like a, a friend who who sees what's going on but obviously the person isn't they are either aren't ready or they don't see it how would you think a friend can support that yeah, person in that definitely advise not to have that conversation in front of the abuser because yeah it, again they're going to know then that you're a person that they need to isolate the victim from because yeah. you're a person that could save them so um just try and maybe invite them out for coffee and go look i saw this um you know you know do you want to talk about it or you know like and and maybe come prepared with the number of a local refuge or the number of a helpline and but just to remember they might not be ready they might stay in that relationship for so many different reasons for kids or for money or for shelter or for whatever reason there's so many different reasons and to not get angry with that person if they're not immediately going to take your help or or they they might say I don't know what you're talking about you didn't see that you know because denial is a strong self survival tactic as well because if you admit that that person was right that they saw that then you have to admit I am a victim of violence and that's really hard for a lot of people to say out loud like you might know it but to admit it out loud and especially to admit it to someone else means you're being more conscious about it. Maybe you have to deal with it then. And it can be embarrassing. It can be humiliating. No one wants to be in that situation. No one expects to be in that situation. Make a plan with them. If you need to, like immediate help, you can call me and hang up or text a code word to me. Um, and then I can call the cops or I can call the refuge or whatever happens to be, um, whatever that person needs. So just ask them what they need. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. really good advice. Um, but on to a different topic now around um, sexual assault um, at universities, just in the university sector in general. We all know that it is a problem. There are many articles, um, documentaries, cases um, to prove it. We can't deny that it is an issue. Um, so from your perspective and your experience of doing workshops, studying this kind of thing, knowing so much about it, what do you think universities should be doing at the moment to prevent prevent sexual assault um, and misconduct? Yeah, there's there's so much to be done, and like yeah, the facts and figures are never going to even fully capture the whole range of what's going on. Because like yeah. you said, there's so many different forms of sexual assault, and some people have not named that to themselves as sexual mm-hmm. assault because maybe it wasn't a different mm-hmm. type of sexual assault. Um, I think the, the most basic thing that university can do would be having free and fast access to support services um, of a variety of types and ones that are inclusive of everybody. So support services yeah. for trans people or for people with disabilities or for sex workers, having that route into either 
local services or having their own services on campus. Um, maybe perhaps through a student union might be better than, you know, a, an official government body or a, yeah. a university body, things like that. Um, having places, having systems in place to report perpetrators as well, but also that don't re-traumatize the victims. And then having, again, education for the people that you're reporting it to for lectures for student unions of like what sexual assault actually is the different ways that it, it takes um, place what consent is things like that so that they understand what what has actually gone on here I think it sends out the message as well if they introduce bystander programs if they're introducing consent classes if they're introducing you know education weeks all these kind of things it is sending out that message that this isn't yeah. something that we're going to tolerate on campus yeah, definitely. Around that with like educating students around consent, around sexual assault, um, that kind of thing. Do you feel like there's enough of that at universities from what you've seen? No, um, I think, no, I think there's a lot more to go. And, you know, like my classes are only what they're like an hour long. Do you know, we're only going to scratch the surface and there's a lot more to to go on that. There's different forms, there's different languages that we can take. So there's visual arts, I think, which is a great way to, to have conversations. So recently, I think it was it last year, the year before, there was um, universities in Ireland all joined together to have it. It stops now harassment campaign. So they poster yeah. lots of the walls with slogans about my my body my choice or you know um whatever it was about sexual assault and left them up there and that was a really great way that people walking by could go yeah oh okay like that that's a thing or there was um in dcu my former college had um underwear hanging up all through the students union on like a like a washing line and underwear of all different sorts like tongs big granny panties like boxer shorts um jock straps whatever it happened to be and all of them were saying none of this equals consent and I thought that was a really powerful thing so that you yeah. didn't have to necessarily sit in a lecture or sit in a workshop yeah. or sit in a classroom with other people you could actually just see that and go past and go yeah so doing things like art installations and, and getting students mm. to come forward themselves and and learn or you know there could be something done around alcohol you know like making an art display out of bottles of vodka and say how many bottles of vodka means consent is violated things like this so there's different ways to think about it and I think students are creative and they're the ones living this experience and I'm sure mm -hmm. that they can come up with some amazing examples of of ways to get this message out there yeah definitely student-led ideas and approaches and projects are always the best Absolutely. I found because yeah. it comes from them they've got the passion and the power to do that it's amazing but I think that's all of the questions um, I'm afraid Caroline but that is this has been like one of the most interesting, if not the most interesting podcast I've ever done. Oh, um, there's so much more we could talk about, but it's been absolutely incredible. Um, and for everyone watching, all of the details about Caroline's um, workshops will be below. Um, and do you mind just telling us your social media so people can follow you, Caroline? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, on Instagram and Twitter, it's Glow West Podcast. Um, and then my personal one over on Instagram is Dr. Caroline West. The, there's less sex stuff on that one. Um, and the sex stuff is more on the on the Glow West account as well. Um, there's a few episodes of the podcast as well around consent as well. There's one with Justine, Justine Amazing. Ang, and then um, Richard Wright, and he talks about how he speaks to men about consent. So that's an interesting one as wow. well. And then we have one about image-based sexual abuse as well. I think that's episode 20 something back in September anyway, as well. So, um, but yeah, and people can reach out as well if they have questions. I know in the workshops, it can be a bit intimidating to ask questions sometimes, um, but they can always reach out to me afterwards and say, oh, I wanted this question. And there's no judgment in that. Did you say that um, there could be people asking questions anonymously when the workshop yes. is going on? So when we're doing Zoom, you can either put a question in the general chat and that means other people can see it or you can send it directly to me and that means yeah. I can see your name or you can mm -hmm. use the anonymous Q&A, which means I can't see your name, no one can see your name and no one else can even see your question, just me. Amazing. So you've got different options for different comfort levels. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much, Caroline. This has been super interesting yeah, and I can't wait me. for the workshop. Yeah, absolutely the same. And don't forget, yeah, like for those who do ask questions and all the free condoms and lube um, and maybe a few extra goodies thrown in as well. So maybe some body safe period products or eco-friendly period products, all that kind of thing. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank Speak you. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.